Rotational molding is a very unique process of making hollow plastic parts. Sizes vary from small to large, thick walls or thin, in a variety of shapes and colors. Processes vary, but the most common system rotates molds on a machine with one or more arms, depending upon the type. These molds are most commonly cast aluminum or fabricated sheet metal. Fabricated and cast aluminum molds are being shown in the video. Rotational molding is a relatively basic process that produces parts by melting plastic resin that sticks to the inside surface of the hot mold. The part forms to the mold, while the inside remains hollow. The common thread to all variations of rotational molding is heat transfer. No matter what type of heat medium is used, the heat must travel from the outside surface of the mold to the inside surface where the polymer buildup will occur. The heat transfer process begins when the mold is subjected to the heat medium being used. As the temperature of the inside surface of the mold increases to a point close to the melt temperature of the resin, the fine particles of powdered resin begin to stick to the mold surface, thus beginning the wall thickness buildup of resin. When vinyl plastisols are being used as a molding material, the rotation of the molds will coat the inside surface with a uniform thickness of plastisol. As the heat reaches the inside surface of the mold, the plastisol begins to gel. The mold continues to rotate as it is cooled by air and or water spray so that the parts retain their even wall thickness and shape. The rotational speed Heating and cooling time are controlled throughout the process with each having a significant impact on the quality of the finished part. Even the mold design, thickness and production condition plays a big part. As with other plastic molding processes, variables can impact product quality. The molding machine is a mechanical device made up of a series of gears, chains and sprockets that brings all mold surfaces in contact with the plastic resin. It has an oven and cooling chamber that must operate at a consistent temperature. Any number of mechanical misalignments can affect the quality of the part produced, and that is the focus of this video. Wall thickness can be manipulated to some extent by varying the rotation ratios, speed of rotation, or angle of tilt. Due to the geometry of some parts, it can be nearly impossible to get an even wall thickness buildup Variables which affect wall thickness buildup are mold positioning on multi-cavity spiders, the construction of spiders or mold mounting frames, uneven mold wall thickness, parting line flanges, etc. These factors affect the rate of heat transfer through the mold wall, thus causing uneven wall thickness. Shielding basically reduces the rate of heat transfer in the specific areas of the mold where the shielding is applied. Examples of how shielding affects wall thickness are as follows. Number one, if the part has areas which are thinner than desired and areas which are thicker than required, you would shield the thick areas to reduce heat transfer, thus causing the material to build up at a different rate than the unshielded areas. With some experimentation, you'll be able to balance the rate of material buildup to yield even wall thickness. This use of shielding could create the need for somewhat longer molding cycles. Two, if your desire is to reduce the wall thickness in specific areas of a molded part, you would shield the area on the mold which has to be thinner. This use of shielding reduces the rate of heat transfer, thus causing less material buildup. It will not have an effect on the molding cycle. Three, Shielding can also be used to create areas of a part which materials will not build up at all. This is especially useful when, due to part design, there are areas which are trimmed out. By doing this, the amount of the initial material shot weight will be reduced, thus reducing material cost. However, some operators look to shielding as a means of solving every wall thickness problem. They blame the mold design or its construction for thickness problems when, in fact, the problem may not be with the mold at all. The common rule of thumb is to only use shielding when all other efforts have failed. Correcting uneven wall thickness should start with a checklist. Uneven oven temperature or a defective burner can affect wall thickness. 
Deteriorated oven gaskets or even the position of the mold on the arm can affect even heating and cooling. The speed of the rotation can also be affected. Any one of these factors can adversely affect the molded part and should be checked before considering shielding. Let's look at an example. Say you have a defective burner, but instead of going over your checklist, you correct the problem by shielding the mold. What happens when the oven problem is corrected? You'll end up with a part problem again, but this time it's caused by your shielding. Making sure all of your mold equipment is working correctly should always be your first step to correct any wall thickness problem. Then, if you still have a problem, shielding could be your next step. Several methods can be used to shield a mold. The method selected depends upon such factors as the desired results, the shape of the mold, and the area to be shielded, among other things. One of the more effective shielding materials used is woven fiberglass cloth. This woven roving cloth consists of heavy-duty strands that can insulate and withstand high temperature. It can be applied in one layer, but several layers may be needed to obtain the desired results. The insulation is bonded to the mold surface with high-temp silicone rubber. Its flexibility allows for application in layers on any shaped areas of a mold. A shield cover is used when no material buildup is required because of part design, thereby reducing scrap and or reduced resin usage per part. This shielding technique utilizes a galvanized sheet with one half inch to one inch flange formed on four sides to create a pan-like structure that is welded to the mold. During the molding cycle, the shield pan allows minimal heat to hit the mold surface, thereby forming a lesser wall than if the shield were not used. Using bolts to mount the pan allows for adjustment to set the pan closer to or farther away from the mold, depending upon desired wall thickness. Another variation of this approach uses metal strips cut three inches in width and welded to the mold surface on their edge. Fiberglass insulation, thermal insulating wool, approximately two inches thick, is then inserted into this area. A sheet metal cover is then attached over the entire area to form a box or whatever shape that's required to provide adequate shielding. This method provides a three inch airspace between the shield and mold. Normally, this will reduce wall thickness to near zero. Shielding can also be accomplished by use of a steel mesh screen attached to the mold. This does not completely block the heat, but interrupts its flow as the mold rotates. The smaller the mesh, the more shielding will take place and the thinner the wall. This technique is normally used on large areas to reduce wall thickness. Multiple layers of mesh may be used to increase the amount of shielding. Screen is usually found from one quarter inch mesh down to window screen size, depending on the amount of heat deflection needed. Various gauges of sheet metal can be quickly and easily attached to the mold to provide shielding in these areas where wire screen shielding is inadequate. Teflon can be used on the inside of the mold to prevent material from forming in a specific area. This technique is primarily used to produce a hole in a part wall, thus reducing material usage and secondary trimming operations. A minimum of one half inch thick Teflon sheet material provides the best insulation because of its ability to resist heat buildup. However, for close tolerance parts, you must closely monitor the Teflon size because the Teflon will continually shrink. Normally, flow gain nozzles are used to direct heated air on specific mold areas. However, some success in reducing heat can be accomplished by mounting a flow gain nozzle horizontally to the mold surface, thereby interrupting the flow of heated air to the surface of the mold. Regardless of the shielding technique used, the goal is to produce a perfect part each and every time. Shielding is not an exact science. It requires a great deal of trial by error. Experiment with these techniques and you will find a solution that works for you. You'll be on your way to making quality parts more efficiently and with less waste.
warning. Shielding is an inexact and constantly evolving science. This video neither addresses all information involving nor uses of shielding and rotational molding. The information presented was called from a variety of sources. While ARM and its contributors believe these to be reliable sources of accurate information, we make no guarantees, warranties, or other representations as to the completeness or accuracy of such information. ARM and its contributors will assume no liability for loss or damage suffered through reliance upon this video or its contents. The viewer is solely responsible for obtaining updated or additional shielding information beyond that presented in this videotape.